this is Lexi Nieto, voice of Tomo Aizawa from Tomo-chan is a Girl, and you're listening to Podcast Across Worlds, Hawaii's number one anime podcast. Welcome to Podcast Across Worlds, where we like to read a lot of manga, watch a lot of anime, and talk about it for hours. I'm your host, Lehua Superfina. I'm your co-host, Miguel Casanova. And today, we have the honor of having Caitlin Glass, a voice actress and senior voice director at Crunchyroll. You have known her for many, many years, maybe way before you knew she even existed, but you recognized her voice. She is amazing. (laughs) Caitlin, is there anything else you would like us to add about you? Anything you want our audience to know about you? Oh my gosh, that was a great introduction. (laughs) Here's this person, you know her. (laughs) <laughs> that's, awesome. that's so sweet um i don't know i think you covered it i'm an actress and i'm a senior voice director at crunchyroll um <laughs> yeah thank you so much for having me that's awesome <laughs> well yeah because i've known about you since escaflone mm-hmm. back in fox kids days oh, and- <laughs> but that wasn't me in Fox Kids Days, that wasn't me. <gasps> that wasn't really? you? No. That uh, when right? Escaflone came out way back in the early 2000s, um, I was not yet voice acting. I started voice acting in 2004, and I was in Escaflone, but in 2017, when Funimation redubbed it. Yeah. So ah, they redubbed I it. I see, I see. Um, yeah, yeah we... They, the four kids, because they had a whole different... Uh, yeah, yeah they had a too, different kind of cut up version to make it i guess more <laughs> kid, kid friendly or something this you know show about war and death um but uh yes yeah, so they they funimation put out a with with kickstarter actually an uncut edition and so in order to put out the full story uncut they had to redub it because there was like new material that mm-hmm. well not new material mm-hmm. there is all the original material which so it, it required a new dub so that's how i ended up being an escaflone um but i hope that maybe i gained new fans because of it because they went oh i know escaflone um and i believe if you got like the big super edition it had the original dub on it as well. And you could watch mm-hmm, like, here's, mm-hmm, here's mm-hmm. the version you saw on TV when you were a kid. And here is, as it was intended to be seen. Plus here's this new, new dub. And then we did the movie as well. Mm-hmm. well I'm, a big fan of, I'm a big fan of your work as Cammy in Street Fighter. Like, it's so crazy because oh, I'm, I'm friends with so many of the cast of Street Fighter. So Gerald, oh, yeah? you know, Michael okay. Coleman and such. It's crazy. So... <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, then this is appropriate timing for this interview because, uh, in just a little less than a month, Street Fighter 6 comes out on June 2nd. So, yeah. we're Capcom creators, so we get early access to it. Oh, no <laughs> kidding! That's yeah. great, that's so cool. Well, you have to play as Cami, of course. <laughs> now, I'm um, I'm really looking forward to it. I, of course, was thrilled to be back in the game. You never know. Like, there's always this fear. Like, when you go, like, "Mm, it's about time for them to start maybe putting out another game if they're going to. And I haven't heard anything yet. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So, thank you, Capcom, for having me back. I hope that you always have me back. Uh, (laughs) I love Cammy. She's very special because um, I didn't play many video games growing up, but I did manage to play Street Fighter. We mm-hmm. didn't have it. We didn't have a system at home, uh, but at my mom's work, uh, she worked at Target. They had um, a Super Nintendo or one of the Nintendos. I don't even remember which version. They had like the one that you would play as um, a, a guest, right? A customer. You go in the electronics department and and you know play. Mm-hmm. They had one of those up in the break room upstairs. So I would go hang out with my mom at work and then just play Nintendo for hours and hours, like in the summertime, and nothing better to do. So. Um, <laughs> I did play a whole lot of Street Fighter and it's always a trip when I'm like, "Uh, I'm in it. I still can't really wrap my my brain around that. I'm I'm in the thing (laughs) since 2008. That's just so cool. So how did you become Cammy? Because from my understanding, when people audition for the characters, they're auditioning for a variety of characters. So is that what happened with you too? Like you were auditioning for different characters and they said, we want you to be Cammy. 
Yes, I did get to read for Cammy though. Like there, there are sometimes where you audition for a character, and then based on what they hear you as, you know, so and so, they may pick you to be somebody else. Um, but in this case, um, I read for Cammy and Chun Li and Sakura and I think Crimson Viper because this was in uh, right before Street Fighter Four, and so Crimson Viper mm-hmm. is one of the new characters mm-hmm. and. Uh, a new game for Street Fighter hadn't been out in like 10 years. Nobody was yeah. like, expecting this, least of all me. I was just a little <laughs> baby voice actor. I'd only been voice acting for a few years. And this audition came my way. And uh, I have never, ever thought that I would get cast at all. <laughs> but <laughs> I auditioned because that's what you do. You don't you don't turn down uh, an opportunity. And um, if anything, I thought if I'm anyone... If, 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 like huge if, if I were to be cast, I thought maybe I would be like Sakura because she's the most like the type of work I was doing at the time, which is like anime teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, and I have kind of just read for Cammy because it was sent to me. So I'm like, well, I guess I'll do this one. I don't know. I mean, the, I knew uh, who the director was. I didn't, I mean, I knew that uh that director wouldn't be casting that capcom would be doing that but uh mm-hmm. i thought they have like real british people they <laughs> that they'll be hearing i'm sure they'll cast us a real brit uh they don't they don't need me putting on this voice but um which apparently they do because they picked it <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that's uh, the, like the biggest surprise of my life i just couldn't like I said, I still sometimes I just act like such a dork about it because it's just wild. Like, really? This uh, okay? Yeah, I'll come do it. <laughs> of course, of course I will. Yes, all the time. Um, I could I could do it all day. And then it just got better when around what is it? Street Fighter Ultimate. Uh, whenever DiCapri came along, oh yeah, uh, I had to play her too. I'm like, that's crazy. Okay, and. <laughs> For that one, I have to thank Talis and Jaffe, I believe, because he was, he was directing those games at the time. And and they were like, Capcom um, was maybe looking, oh, who could be, who can we get to play DiCapri? It's like Cammy's kind of clone sister. And Talison was like, why wouldn't it be Caitlin? And like, well, <laughs> she's already Cammy. Why wouldn't it be her? He calls me. He's like, you can do a Russian accent, right? I'm like, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> da. <laughs> so uh I I actually don't remember if at the time I had one or not, but he's like, Well, I told them that you can. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay, great. I'll get right on that. <laughs> um, and thankfully uh, they were pleased and I'm so pleased as well. It's it is quite a trip to hear yourself in a scene with yourself and getting to have mm-hmm. the two very distinct accents and very distinct personality types uh, for the two characters uh, is pretty great. So um, I can check that off the bucket list also. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, we know that, yes, you've been very, very busy from like 2014 onward. We saw that you were in 20 plus titles every year. That's like five different animes and games every season. Yeah. Yeah. I Even I You're didn't busy. know that stat. Hey, thanks for that stat. What is it again? Uh, since 2014, every year I was in 20 titles. Each year. Yeah. 20 plus oh. titles. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's... I... I I'm going to just burst the bubble. I don't want people to think, oh my gosh, Caitlin's just so great. 2014, <laughs> that sounds like uh, the advent of the simul dub. That's when that started happening uh, at, at then Funimation, now Crunchyroll. So this idea mm-hmm. that we're going to put out shows as they come out in Japan. And granted, it was it was a slow build. I think it was actually 2015 when that started. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, like now we do, like I can't even count. 24 30 some odd number of shows every season um as they come out in japan it's a trip but back then we were just starting to do that thing but still what it meant is that like every you know every three months there's a new smattering of shows and back Uh then it was just a little handful and now it's you know like every three months it's another 20 20 30 shows um to deal with um maybe not that many but 
So that would be why. There's just a lot more <laughs> anime all of a sudden uh, being produced. So that could be it. Or, well, you know. yeah, it was also video games, too. And it yeah. reminded me of how you said that you were given the script and you did the job. Like, you just did it because, you know. <laughs> You don't say no to work. You don't say no to work. (laughs) And um, a lot of, I think, aspiring voice talent out there think that the job is the work, but actually auditioning is is the work. Auditioning (laughs) is the job. And like booking the job is like, oh, now I get paid. (laughs) (laughs) But, But we spend so much more of our time or we should be spending so much more of our time auditioning. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, throwing some of your best work out there and just hoping someone likes it enough (laughs) uh, to to book you. Yeah. So how you you've kind of been around through the evolution of anime in the U.S. Because it seemed like, you know, we've we've been getting some anime here and there little by little. And then some networks started getting more like. Cartoon Network, Toonami, they started getting more anime on their Mm -hmm. network. What was it like seeing that evolution, like seeing more voice acting, more voice actors coming into the industry? Because Uh, it was like only this much to now this much. uh, It was was great because I like anime. (laughs) I, (laughs) I I didn't set out to become a voice actor or to become an anime voice actor even um, like at all. Uh, I set out to be an an actor professionally, and then I kind of fell into voice acting because of uh, where I lived. Uh, But I already, as an actor, liked anime. So (laughs) to see more of it, regardless of whether I was in it or not, uh, was just really exciting. And Mm -hmm. it's it's cool that you use the word evolution of of anime in America, because that's absolutely what it's been like. Um, It's funny, each time there's a new big show that comes along, it, the feeling is the same, which I think is really neat. Um, it makes me, it kind of keeps me young. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is just like how it felt in Full Metal Alchemist. But I'm like, Full Metal Alchemist was in 2004, y'all. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting close to. I mean, it's already celebrated its 20 year anniversary, like for the manga. But for the show, it came out in the states in in 2004, and um, I remember like the furor and the excitement. Uh, Fuhrer? The f- fervor. <laughs> like the Fuhrer. No, that's a character in the show. The fervor. Sorry, guys. <laughs> wow. Again, I told you I was napping just 20 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> um, I remember all of that and going around on the convention circuit as the show was coming out in English on Toonami, uh, like you mentioned. And uh, little by little, you know, Toonami started picking up more anime. Uh, but even those anime were shows that had already been out in Japan for a time full metal was mm-hmm. probably one that was like popular right then and had come out in japan only just a, a little bit before you were seeing it on tv here uh but now we're, we're getting stuff as it comes out and we already know what to be hyped about and in the case of some shows we get the show in english and other dubs on the same day uh that it comes out in japan i think it's really really cool it's a great great time to be an anime fan um <laughs> Uh, it's a great time to be an actor. <laughs> There's lots of work, <laughs> lots of work uh, to be had. Um, so it's exciting. And I hope that it uh, you know, continues to grow. I can't imagine what it could mean next. Like it already seems like we got a good thing going. I don't know how to make it bigger or better, but uh, leave it to anime. I'm sure it'll find a way. <laughs> right. Yeah. So how did it come from? Okay. This anime has been out for years in Japan, and then the U.S. has decided, okay, we want to dub this now to simulcast. Like, that is insane. It went from being dubbed years later to being dubbed at the same time. Like, what was the progression to that point? Like, like when you really think about it, too, like, think about, like, you know, we were younger. I'm dating us by saying that. It's okay. Date us. No shame. Okay, look, I was a kid in the 90s, so I'm already dating Maybe myself. That's where... Anyways, um, so like when you look at like how Dragon Ball Z and, and Yu Yu Hakusho and Inuyasha and all that was like popular in early 2000s, like mm-hmm. that came out like a decade plus ago in Japan. So it's crazy like, when you think about it, 
now with anime like you're saying like day and day like it's so much better being an anime fan now mm-hmm. than like back then We're and not playing catch up <laughs> no but a lot of people think that like anime hasn't been good since like the toonami era and i'm like seriously they're not I've watching enough they're not i watching know right then uh, that, and like that could be because they're still um just taking in their anime via what they can get off of like cable television and as we mm. know media and entertainment have pretty much moved on from that and yeah. uh but anime is still kind of uh, well it's it's one of the it's mainstream and that everybody knows what it is now but people who say they watch it it's still kind of a niche thing so to yeah. get the most you really need to subscribe to a service and i'm not just saying this because i work for them but like crunchyroll or the high dive or something like that uh, and little by little anime is making its way to other places like disney plus and amazon prime and stuff like that um but it could be that whoever thinks anime hasn't been good since you know the early 2000s it's it, good shows are still on toonami but i feel like there's some really great shows that they haven't picked up or won't or can't or i don't really know how all of that works so you just got to tell them like man where are you watching hulu has a bunch uh hulu has a bunch <laughs> of like crunchyroll's titles they get them like mm-hmm. after after the season has ended then hulu will pick up like the whole show so for binge yeah. watchers they can just watch it all um right then but um what was i gonna say i forgot oh you would ask like how do we get here i can't exactly speak for the literal how because i'm just a voice director uh but i imagine that the change came about out of necessity um mm-hmm. as the as the internet became a place where people lived more and more uh, anime piracy was a big problem Mm. so people wouldn't like they don't want to pay for cable and they still want to to what to watch the three shows that are on there that are like you said old uh so (laughs) in order to see what is new and current they turn to to pirating and that's when like BitTorrent and stuff was a big thing and you could like torrent all your favorite shows and people would fan sub them so like they had to do something like how can we get fans what they want and what they want is the anime that's current so it was a kind of an experiment can we do this can we do this thing i think we even did a simul dub that was a like a broadcast television simul dub and that was um space dandy uh didn't oh. it, it came out like in english and hadn't come out in japan yet until it came out in english um on tv here and then from then on it, it was like okay streaming started becoming a thing that people were into and mm-hmm. and uh then it, that's that's really how it was able uh to take off so yeah okay. i think i guess <laughs> <laughs> wow thank you so much for sharing that story like kind of like the background history of simulcasting tv <laughs> To streaming, to being global. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about it. We have cable and we barely watch it except for wrestling. Well, I remember yeah. like when cable on demand was starting and yeah. that was my only way of looking up anime titles that I didn't know existed or if I missed their episodes, I'll go and search and see if I could play it. <laughs> Yeah, that that was the thing. And there was also like Funimation and maybe even what is now Sentai, but before was ADV, you know, had their own. Uh, yeah, ADV had like the anime network or something mm-hmm. like that. They had a channel and then Funimation had a channel, but you had to have that particular cable service, of course, and then subscribe to whatever package would give you all mm-hmm. of, uh, the niche channels. But I think that started to get a lot of things um in front of folks that wouldn't have seen it otherwise there's a time i think when they were shopping around shows that we already had that we had made for home video um shopping them around to individual cable networks that might be interested in that type of story um so like this particular one is a real big sci-fi show so let's see if the sci-fi network wants to pick it up or Mm -hmm. uh, things like that um independent film channel that was one and they were of course interested in in anime so some of the the headier kind of fancier titles like say samurai seven which is based on akira kurosawa seven samurai like that was on Mm -hmm. um ifc 
Uh, but they don't do that anymore either. <laughs> it's all like, <laughs> you like anime? Buy streaming service. <laughs> we have centralized everything. You want to yeah. find a certain genre? We got it. Yeah. <laughs> no if more like, cruising around. <laughs> if you like My Hero Academia and Demon Slayer, you can watch that on Toonami. If you want to see anything else, <laughs> go get a streaming service. <laughs> Yeah, and they made it so convenient by having Crunchyroll, Funimation, and then letting Hulu take in some of the series on their channel too. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's kind of making cable not needed anymore, but still needed, but I mean, kind of not. Ways it's not. <laughs> yeah, but it? it's ending up costing so much though, just to have even all of the streaming services because like they fight for the type of content and everybody each inst and like there are niche places we were just having a discussion about this at work the other day actually there are niche things like Crunchyroll or there's like the streaming criterion collection if you're really into like old classic good films um but otherwise all the other services apple tv and netflix and etc they try to give something of everything for everyone but they still don't have everything so that's how yeah. you'll be like oh well i want to watch ted lasso so i gotta have apple tv and i want to watch this particular k drama so i have to have uh amazon prime or i want so in the end you're still paying like hundreds of dollars a month for everything that <laughs> that you stream um and it, that kind of stinks you went from being a voice actress to senior voiced director you make it sound like such a big deal <laughs> Deal. You climbed up the ladder. <laughs> I don't know. One day they just called me and said, You have a new title. It's senior voice director. I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, nah, it just means I have like some more responsibilities and um, things that I have to. I'm, I'm like, It's like a leadership position, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but sure, it's a. I don't know. I just feel like my really believe in the shows that I get. I try to challenge mm -hmm. myself with every title that I'm given to work on. Um, usually, maybe in the way that I, I cast it, typically in the way that I cast the show. And then, I, I don't know, just something about it people are into. But I also try to choose titles that I want to work on. And that doesn't always work out. You don't always get the thing that you want. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to do something that you don't want to work on. Um, that can happen, but there are times where it, like I could look at the slate of shows we're getting and know which one is going to be the big thing that everyone will be into, but mm. maybe, maybe I'm not into that. So I don't ask for it just to have the thing that is the big thing. Um, mm -hmm. and then that way I can like whatever I'm working on the story that I'm telling. And it could mean that it's a more understated sort of like, female driven isekai or something like that um mm -hmm. but like i'm gonna have a good time because i picked it <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to whatever the you know crazy shonen on fire show of the month is so uh, that's not like a dig at fire force at all that was just the, that was <laughs> it's not fire force is cool i'm in it it's really good i look forward to season three um whenever whenever that happens um but yeah, that that's all, I guess, if you're looking for me to like divulge, like, what's your secret? Um, trying to figure out based on just little uh, PVs that everybody else gets to see when they hear about, here are the shows that are coming out. Those same things that you have to look at as a fan to go, what might I want to watch? I'm looking at those to go, what might I want to direct? <laughs> and crossing my fingers that the thing that looks good ends up being good and uh if it isn't good i'm gonna make it as good as i possibly can Heck yeah. Um, yeah so that's that's it and and sometimes things like they look good and sweet and like i know well i'm gonna have a really good time with this and then it turns out to be like this overnight like explosion like everybody it isn't just kind of good it's super good everyone is really into that thing and whenever that happens, um, I just feel so very blessed. That's happened a, a few times uh, over the years. People were really into like Shadow's House when I did that one. Um, uh, Horimiya was like this big surprise. Yeah. And um, uh, Tomo-chan is a girl. That's another one. Uh, well, I kind of knew. I knew that one was going to be great. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, mm, that's the one. Uh, I knew when they asked me just to direct the trailer. 
and that's all I was doing. I think Lexi talked to you guys about this. Um, they mm-hmm. needed the they needed the trailer uh, and they wanted it in English to take to Anime Expo last year. So coming up on about a year ago, um, and I just had a few weeks to do it. And they said, you know, this particular role, there's uh, two voices in the trailer, and one is Tomo and the other is Carol. And they said, Carol has already been cast, and it's Sally Yamaki, and it's this voice you're hearing in Japanese. And she'll, here, here it is in English. I'm like, oh my gosh, crazy. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, so they're like, so you just need to like pick the Tomo, and that's that. I'm like, you're not, we, we're not telling you that you're directing it. Just do this. I'm like, oh, well, um, okay. <laughs> so I directed the trailer, and then the more I thought about it, I was like, that sounds like a really cool, challenge and a new thing to be a part of having Mm -hmm. um, the Japanese say you also play their their role in English so I expressed an interest just within weeks of the trailer being done just letting letting who who may concern uh, know that I would be interested in directing it if it fit into my schedule um, if they wanted to have me when the time came Mm -hmm. and apparently they did because that's that's uh that's how it happened and we had so much fun (laughs) so much fun on that show Yes. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, because I read the manga first, like years ago. It was one of the titles I recommended to Mikkel. And when I saw the trailer and I saw that it was an anime and it was being dubbed, I was like super excited. <laughs> I had high expectations. <laughs> Did they meet your expectations? Were your expectations met? <laughs> Great. Good. Good. <laughs> Because I read the manga as well, not when it was new, not when it was like a four panel comic or even when it came out. Um, But I, of course, read it before we got started on the show, Mm -hmm. as I will typically do if there is a manga available. So, yeah, it was great. (laughs) So what is the process then for you kind of gave us idea that you would see the PVs for the animes and then you guys just pick out which title you want to work on without even knowing the story you just base it off the tv and yeah. then you work from there like what's the process of the whole production if you don't mind sharing with us i don't mind i'll share like what i can and hopefully i don't reveal any like industry secrets but a lot of how the sausage get gets made is still kind of unknown to me because like i said just because i express an interest in the show doesn't mean that I'm going to get it and that Mm -hmm. isn't because my bosses are mean or anything but it it literally just has to do with scheduling Uh, it's crazy it's like Tetris all of the studios that we have and um, especially if a show when is the show coming when does it uh, premiere what expectations do the Japanese have for when it's going to air meaning like is it going to air what we call day and date so in Japanese and English and maybe also Spanish or Portuguese or whatever on the same day or do we have like two weeks Um, so that matters and then looking at the shows that you're currently doing and when they end and when your next two shows can potentially start and whose rooms, meaning studios, there are 12 staff directors uh, during the day. Like, where is it going to fit? How many night studios do we need? It's a lot. So sometimes your wishes simply can't be accommodated. And also, I mentioned there are 12 of us all fighting for the same shows. So like, we're while there may be some things where you're like, oh, I really want that one whatever because I like cooking shows I want to do the food show and you might be the only person so okay you're probably going to get that but other times it's like oh everybody wants to direct hell's paradise or something just speaking like what what's out right now that's a big deal hell's paradise and so how they decide who gets it that is I don't know that's some sort of magical fairy decision is made <laughs> elsewhere <laughs> we just sit that home crossing our fingers going do I get to do what I want but usually we, we turn in a list of you know here are a bunch of things that I'm interested in and why um, sometimes you don't get to do anything new because old shows come back and you're you're already attached uh, to something and uh, so, so you're going to be working on more of of whatever uh, that old show is like right now I'm doing a uh, ranking of Kings treasure chest of courage because I directed season one of ranking of Kings um, last year or the year before that. It's all uh, the pandemic years are all just one big year. Can we just call it? <laughs> so, yes. None of us want to believe that it was really like two and a half years stuck at our house. So that whole time uh, somewhere in there, I did ranking of Kings. So now I'm doing it uh, again. Um, but then we, uh, of course, the show has to come out. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes 
it's getting more and more that more and more frequent for us to get to work on a show in advance, like many weeks or months even in advance of it coming out in English and Japanese. Um, but that really just depends on the Japanese company and and their ability to get all of the materials to us uh, with advanced uh, notice. And sometimes they can, and sometimes they can't. And that's okay. That it's all has to do with how their companies function. And again, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> but like with, to- <laughs> yeah, with, with Tomo, um, when were, we started working on Tomo in like October last year, which was two months before it started airing, two or three months, wasn't it a winter title? So it didn't air until like January. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had everything. We had the m- most of the materials. Uh, by the time Sally came out in November to record her stuff. And then she, there were still a few episodes left. So we had mm-hmm. to connect with her over the internet and record the last few episodes with her in Japan, which is pretty neat. That's a first for me. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So the show's got to come out. And then we have uh, translators, of course, who will translate it. And they're the ones who uh, make the subtitles. And then those translations go out to all of the different language uh, folks um, mm-hmm. So at Crunchyroll, we we are we just do English in house, and then all of the other language dubs that are um, part of what we release. I think that those are like contracted or something. I just want to mm-hmm. make it clear that in Dallas is where we record the English stuff, mm-hmm. and all of the other languages are I think handled by the countries where that language is most most prevalently uh, spoken. Um, oh. though, I'm, though I'm not sure about Latin American uh, Spanish. I don't know where that is recorded, uh, to be honest, if it's done in Mexico or if it's done like in Florida. I, I don't know. But it's not done at Crunchyroll Studios is what I'm trying to say. Um, so, yeah, the, we get a translation and then a, the writing, adaptive writing department gets uh, the scripts and they can usually write one script in about 24 hours or so. Uh, they wow. don't, they don't. Yeah, it doesn't mean that they turn it around and give it to you literally 24 hours later. They work like a normal schedule, normal eight hour workday. So they get a translation and like three or four days later, I get a script and I have five days to direct every episode. Um, so like and it's not always Monday to Friday, like I could start on Thursday. So it'll be Thursday to the following Wednesday and we don't work on weekends. Um, but yeah, five days to do one episode, but it's not the only episode I'm working on. I'm typically working on two shows at a time, uh, sometimes more. If I have like an old show that came back, it's going to home video or something like that. So I might be like mm. re- reviewing it in the background <laughs> uh, <laughs> while uh, I'm working on directing the the two current shows. So it is, it is kind of a lot. Um, and you just never know. Sometimes you can have really easy shows that are just a breeze. Uh, maybe they're very action heavy. So that means there's not a lot of dialogue. So it's really easy to get them recorded. And other mm-hmm. times it's like we have this show and every episode we have to tell you the history of the, the universe of the show. And there's so many words and so much talking. And um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, then you record it. Then I work with uh, the recording engineer, the ADR engineer. We review everything, make sure it looks how I, I want it to look, sounds how I want it to sound. Uh, if there's mm-hmm. anything that's wrong or off, I can ask to get those actors back. But I only have about a day or two to get them back to fix the little issues. The, mm-hmm. episode, the episode goes off to another engineer called a mix engineer. And they make it sound the way you will hear it at, at home. So they um, mess with all of the levels of the sound effects and the music and the dialogue, the volume levels of all of that. They put all the filters on things so they sound like they're on the phone or they're underwater or they're in another room or whatever room or place the characters are speaking in. They will make their voices sound like they're in the kitchen or in, you know, a grand cathedral or outdoors in the woods, wherever. They add all of that stuff. (laughs) And then I watch it again and give any notes to them for any changes. And um, then once I'm done with that, off it goes. And that whole process of like reviewing it with my booth engineer and then typically two days later is when I will watch the mix of that episode. And then the next day after watching the mix, I go, okay, final approval and off it goes. And sometimes in the case of like ranking of Kings, the very next day is when it goes up online and you see it. 
Like that's that's how wow. tight that's how tight the turnaround is. Yeah. Crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> and this is multiple shows at once. Jeez. Yeah. Twelve people doing that. <laughs> Uh, plus folks working at night too, and also other studios that we subcontract out because there's so much anime to do and not enough rooms to do it in. So we reach out to other uh, studios that we know uh, to give them whole shows. And sometimes that works out because of where casts are located. Um, because of the merge, you know, with, with Crunchyroll, Funimation and Crunchyroll merging, we ended up with titles that used to be what we call like legacy Crunchyroll. And now it's all Crunchyroll. So we've got people... And, and it isn't just that. It's so much dubbing was done during those pandemic years. And during that time, there was remote. Everybody was remote. So actors mm -hmm. were from all over the country. And then some actors have like made major life changes during that pandemic and moved to other parts of the world even. And then their show comes back and we have to be like, well, are we going to record you while you're in Finland or, you know, or what are we going to do? Um, it's crazy. Uh, it's, nuts. it's neat that the option to keep that voice actor voicing the character is neat because I remember there was a time where we heard different voices on characters and I don't even remember who they were, but I just remember, oh, this person sounds different. I'll get used to it. Now mm -hmm. it's like, we want to keep you. Can this happen? I like that. <laughs> yeah, I think that the fans appreciate it. They want to hear the, the actors that they you know came to know when they first you know, watch the show. So we do whatever we can to accommodate uh, that whenever possible. Thank goodness, because the <laughs> outrage people would have. It's like, this is not Tomo! You know, <laughs> a, good, a good example is like Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core. When they uh, oh, redid yeah. that last year and they got the new voice cast, mm -hmm. a lot of us were like, that's not Zach. That's not Rick Gomez. Right, but it's been a number of years, though. So sometimes mm -hmm. it, it depends, like how how old is the title that is getting in this case, like yeah. remastered? Um, are those actors uh, around or still able to sound as young as they did uh, before? Mm -hmm. that, that that could be it, or um, some things it could have to do with, like if I even want to mention this, like union affiliations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it could be, I mean, not in the case of something like Final Fantasy, but if there's a show that was, you know, 20 years ago and it was probably non union, and then those actors maybe have moved on and they've joined SAG and they live in a different area and the game or the show is still non union and they can't do it anymore. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. So, of course, the fans hate it. Absolutely. And I wish that it didn't have to be that way, but it happens. It happens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are like out of your control, but if you can, we really appreciate that you guys make the effort to yeah. keep us happy. <laughs> Thank of course, you. Of course. Yeah. I think, yeah, well, that's all I'm going to say about that. Or I'll, I'll say more than I should. So <laughs> I'll cut that part out. <laughs> so what is there's like a time period you guys have to keep within to make it to that first episode. Like, it seems like it takes either months, weeks, days. Like, what's the shortest amount of time you had to work until that first episode of the season? Um, Crunch some, time. Right. Some directors, like I said, we, we put in our requests for what show we want to do. And then you're just waiting to see what how it's going to shake out for the season and maybe you find out the show that you are being given its first episode in Japanese is airing like tomorrow which means that within a week or less you're going to be directing it like starting it you're going to have actors in your booth and you're going to have to know everything about your show and maybe you just expressed a passing interest in it like maybe it was third or fourth on your list and you didn't think you're going to end up with that thing so it hasn't happened to me knock on wood which doesn't mean that <laughs> here's someone there you go uh, but but it has happened to my colleagues where they're like well i got that show that i asked for i didn't know that it was starting so soon and now i gotta cast it and be ready to go and it could be a show that has a manga and so now they need to get a hold of that and read as much of it as possible before they get started. Um, mm -hmm. But even, if, I hate to say this, even if they don't and are unable to do that, that's not such a bad or horrible thing. Um, 
you're going to want to find out what you can when you can, mm-hmm. because in the cases of some shows, it's important to know that character that you think is a female is actually a male or vice versa, or, Hey, that one, that character is going to die in like the third episode. So if you were thinking of using super big deal, veteran voice actor, maybe don't because they're about to be dead. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it would be nice to know that stuff, but I'd say like maybe half of the shows we work on come from pre-existing material, but a lot mm-hmm. of things, a lot of things are brand new or some things come from pre-existing material, but we don't have access to that source material. Maybe it was some random isekai video game that only came out in Japanese, uh, you know, and we don't exactly mm-hmm. have the resources as individuals to um, to get a hold of what's the plot of that. I don't know. So we rely a lot on whatever research we can do on the internet. And when you only have a couple of days, your priority is typically going to be get the thing cast. You have to cast mm-hmm. it. And it can take a while to go through all of uh, the auditions in our database that we have that we update every season. And you'll do a bit of research and maybe realize, well, this particular character is kind of tricky. I don't know if I can figure them out just on the auditions in the database. So let me make some new ones. And like that can take a day. Then you got to get them to the actors, give them some time to look at them. If auditions Mm. are being uh, disseminated through an agent, you need to, that takes a little bit of extra time too. It's crazy. So when you say what's the least amount of time, um, we always have five days once we start recording to get the episode done. Um, But Mm there are sometimes only a few days before recording begins that you even know what you're working on. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so my question is what is a typical work week like for you? Because you're working on so many different (laughs) things. You know, like, Oh man. (laughs) How do you manage? They're going to play. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know how I managed. It's a big roller coaster. It really is. If I've learned anything over, this is my eighth, eighth year as like a salaried employee of the directing staff at um, Funimation, now Crunchyroll. Um, And it just, every year, there was a time where it really felt like major growing pains, like very much pushing a boulder up a hill. And Mm -hmm. now I think it is not as difficult. Um, doesn't mean that problems still don't come up because they definitely do. And also big disappointments as well. Um, But typical, typical work day, work week um, is 10 to six, a direct from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then if I have any voice acting at Crunchyroll, like in Crunchyroll titles, I'll be staying uh, beyond 6 p.m. to do that recording one day or two days a week it just depends on uh, how many shows I'm in and wh- what how big the role is mm-hmm. um yeah sometimes if it's something like <clears throat> like Mina Ashido for example she doesn't say a whole lot so when we were working on season six once a week I would hop over to the studio Colleen was in and I would say like three or four lines and then go back to my studio. You know, it's like 15 minutes over there, 30 minutes max, not a big deal. But um, if I've got anything bigger going on, uh, like I did Ice Guy and his uh, cool female colleague or whatever the title is, I feel bad that I can't remember the exact title because I really love being in this show, but it is like I- Ice Guy and his cool colleagues or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had so much fun in that one. And that one weekly was anywhere from an hour to like three hours of recording. Uh, a week just depended. Um, so, so that's, that's that. And then if I happen to be fortunate enough to have any other acting work someplace else, um, that will usually be in the evening as well. If I can swing it, if I am recording something with the Los Angeles studio, they are often kind enough to let me record remotely. And then later in the day, so I get home and, um, we'll record with them for a couple of hours. Um, sometimes we work on games, uh, as, as actors, not as crunchy role people, um, work on a game that might be connecting with a studio in another part of the world. So sometimes I don't step into the booth to record until 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. because we're connecting with um, like Seoul, Korea or something like that so that the client can be on the line, which is always exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? 
uh, somewhere in there. I managed to fit in auditions for other things. So that's usually in the morning before I had to work. Um, so yeah, <laughs> get up in the morning, get ready, uh, hop in the booth, record some auditions for 30 minutes to an hour, uh, mm -hmm. go to work. And if I missed any auditions, then my engineer will like help me out when we finish early with an actor, I'll squeak in some audition work, uh, from the studio, but I prefer to, um, record them here in my booth because then it, it sounds like how it would sound if they booked me from home. So. Okay. Um, so <laughs> by, by Friday night, when everything is done, you're like, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're done friends. We're done. We yeah. can starts now <laughs> pretty much pretty much if i'm not already on a plane going like to a convention or something like that so oh speaking yeah. of conventions how was uh your time here in hawaii at oh Kauai? it was the best i man it was gone too fast and i mean <laughs> i mean the convention part of it i made the most out of like the three or four extra days that we stayed uh mm -hmm. in hawaii but um the convention itself was just over like in a flash. And I don't know if it's because I was constantly busy that like always people at my table, I managed mm. to maybe get away and poke around the vendor hall for maybe, maybe an hour total the whole mm -hmm. weekend. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was crazy. And there's so many really amazing artists that I wanted uh, to see. I did buy a couple things here and there, but had, had I had the time, uh, I would have maybe needed <laughs> another suitcase. Uh, <laughs> at every convention do you like to visit the booths and see all the local artists yes typically i i spend a lot of time in the artist alley more than i do in the regular uh vendor hall unless there's something i know that is like a licensed good that i'm looking for um hmm. Um, or something that is like official Japanese merchandise that I might be like a particular figure. Um, because even though you can go online and, and always get those, period, uh, it's fun mm -hmm. to like find it. You know, it's like, look, it's me. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll always, Hunter. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like figures. So I'll make a quick trip and look for like the figure booths. And if I know that there's like a new VV figure or somebody, usually a character that I know, they're always making new figures of it, like something from One Piece or maybe from Love Live. Um, I'll be looking for those. But uh, otherwise I dig, I dig the artist alleys. They're fun. It's just neat to see I don't have that type of artistic ability. So I'm just in awe of everyone's work. And I usually mm -hmm. come home with way too many stickers and enamel pins <laughs> and BTS keychains. <laughs> then I know what to do with it. <laughs> do you gravitate towards like the figurines, merch and such? Is there any type of artwork you tend to gravitate towards? Mm. I like, I, I'm always looking for, and it's going to sound like I'm really self-centered, but it, that's not it at all. I'm looking for artists who've drawn my character because then I will buy multiple ones of it. And I'm like creating a stockpile and I can save them for when conventions ask me to sign things for charity mm -hmm. uh, and, instead of just giving them like here's the print that I sell at my table. Be like, here's this, you know, 11 by 17 big poster thing of Haruhi that you could only have purchased if you were at Kauai Con, for example. Um, and then maybe someday if I ever open like an online streaming autograph, something I would have kind of like special art, like here's this, there are unlimited quantities of this picture, but this one right here, I only have three of it. So um, I'm getting a, a growing collection of just really different and neat looking uh, Minas and, and Haruhis and Winry and like Damien from Spy Family. So that's mainly what, what I'm looking for because while I can commission artists, I sometimes have a hard time figuring out what I want to ask them for. It's just like, uh, draw Mina, you know, <laughs> you know? Uh, so here, like the artists have already figured it out for me and you go, yes, that's it. That's what I want. So I'll just buy and I go up and they'll have some sale, like buy two, get one. And I'm like, great. Can I please have 10? <laughs> and they're like, 10, <laughs> Mina. I'm like, yeah. How many do you have? Give me all of them. <laughs> um, and then let's see, I already, I, I cracked the egg. I'm a big BTS uh, fan, the BTS army. So I'm, I love 
seeing army like expressing their love for the band and their music and the group like in in art so that's really fun <laughs> and i share that love with some folks that i work with at crunchyroll so it's a cute way to like show that i was thinking of them while i was at the convention and i'll buy like a little <laughs> sticker a little something and i always have um like BTS Lomo cards at my signing table and I give them away uh, to, to fans who are ARMY. So when I find uh, artists that are as well, I always make conversation with them and find out who their bias is. And then I'll, <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go back by their table before the weekend is out and like give them a card of, of uh, you know, whoever Yoongi or whoever they, they said. So that's just a fun thing that is made uh, conventioning more, it's going to sound awful, more bearable. Um, so I mean, conventions are super fun but they're also my job too yeah and I've already worked all week and then I'm working all weekend to go straight back to work so um you got to find something that like sparks joy <laughs> at that place and uh and that's that's what does it for me which is cool I like how you make the most of it in everything like for <laughs> example when you said you visited vendor booths and you look for artists that are making a are creating art based off characters that you've worked as and you're repurposing it and also giving those artists some exposure too. And it's like, everything's connected for you. Like, yeah, <laughs> from here to there. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll find things and you know, maybe take them to cast members that aren't at the convention or that don't do conventions yet. Mm -hmm. uh, some things will become like art that I hang up in my studio at work uh so yeah that's all <laughs> I like that <laughs> and then when you're at conventions what do you like to do outside of it though like during uh, that free time when we have free time slither. if we have free time <laughs> you know sometimes I'm just super dead from just giving so much energy all day mm -hmm. and all I will want to do is eat and like then go back to my room and uh and recharge because you have to like charge yourself back up to go back out and do it again the next day mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so there there are days like that it also depends on what other guests are there with you and if you're there with like your really good friends who are super high energy uh, you know, like mm -hmm. Rico Fajardo or Lexi or something, Adam MacArthur, <laughs> you're going to be doing something. And I'm always down for that. I just never like having to figure out what it is, I guess, because in my daily life as a director, like I'm always doing the figuring out, I'm uh -huh. always making all of the decisions and telling the what's what. So like, I love to eat with people. I hate figuring out what to eat or where we're going to go. So I'm like, just call me, That's tell sweet. me what time to meet you in the lobby. <laughs> and I'm down to hang out with you guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, things, <laughs> things that I like to do if I'm able, like if I get to town maybe on early enough on a Thursday, for example, so I'm there like a Thursday night, I like to maybe go see a play. I see plays um, a lot uh, here in Dallas, and it's always nice to just go see some somewhere else. So if I'm in a city that like has some good theater, I'm going to seek it out and try and see something uh, while I'm there. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And uh, eat good food. Those are the main things. <laughs> Catch up with friends because uh, while actors who come in to work at the studio, they come in, they do their stuff, and then they get to go like see other actors in the lobby and then you know go to lunch or go to dinner. Like I'm still there. I'm there all day. So I only <laughs> see like the people who come into my booth and then you know whoever I catch during our lunch break. Uh, so being at conventions is really when you get to connect with the people that you work with. Um, but in a big group instead of just you, an engineer, an actor, just three people <laughs> at a time. So cons are a great place just to just to catch up. Yep. Okay. So um, for you, like outside of work and everything else that you're doing, like what do you like to do for fun? Like just <laughs> your like vested interests and hobbies. And stuff. What does Caitlin like to do? Yeah. <laughs> well, I already mentioned I like to uh, go to the theater. I like mm -hmm. to be in the theater when I have the time um, and uh, you know you have to be cast just like any acting you have to audition and then they have to mm -hmm. cast you so I I kind of look at my schedule and decide hey when do I really need 
sometimes I just need to be in a play. It's a, it's a thing, you know, like that's, that's what started it all. So I'll talk with my husband about it. Like, do you think we would have time? Could I audition for blank blank this season? And, and we'll kind of decide like, yeah, but then even auditioning doesn't guarantee that I'm going to be cast. Um, Mm -hmm. so at theater, that's a big part of my life. Uh, I enjoy going to the symphony, um, a lot. So I do that. Uh, what else? Hang out with my husband, hang out with my dogs and my mom, mm-hmm. um, watch a lot of K-dramas <laughs> and, uh, we like Disney a bunch. So we take a, a lot of trips, uh, to, uh, Disneyland resort in California, not out to Florida, nothing against them. It's just, I had found that I was having a lot of work in Los Angeles, um, pre-pandemic so we decided to buy annual passes. So whenever I'd go out and do work, then we would stay for a few days and do Disney stuff. So we've just kept up with with that. So um, this next weekend, in fact, we are going out uh, to Disneyland to go have a good time for a few days. So, so that's, that's that's about it. Those are those are the things that I'm into. <laughs> Are you going to dress up when you go to Disneyland? Because you can't dress up like in costumes, but you can like wear clothes that kind of look like they have that theme. Here's the thing. You can't dress up unless like you can do Disney bounding, which is what you just described. Yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah. Of, like, it's like hidden. Like if you know, you know. Um, and we've, <laughs> we've done that before. But you can dress up if you go to their themed events. And we are going to an evening star wars themed event and i am totally dressing up uh saturday night live put out a sketch in 2016 and it was like uh what it oh oh, oh my gosh the name of it just totally escaped me that show where it's like oh undercover boss right so they did this undercover boss of kylo ren um where he goes undercover on star killer base or wherever and he plays uh this guy named matt the radar technician and it's like (laughs) one of my favorite sketches in a long time because i just i love kylo ren he cracks me up and then he really cracks me up as this matt the radar technician character so i am going as matt the radar technician i can't wait i can't wait (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's good times uh but we've dressed up before like last year we went to the Oogie Boogie Bash, which is the Halloween party. And I went as Merida. Uh, but Merida from Wreck-It Ralph, the Ralph Breaks the Internet. So like her pajamas outfit. And we've gone for a Valentine's event. And my husband and I were like more, that was more bounding, Disney bounding. We did Peter Pan and Wendy. So yes, you got to dress up when you can. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh, oh, because something else that I love to do as an actor, I can't believe I didn't mention it because it is the season for it, is um, Ren Fairs. I love the Renaissance Fair. So I spend, oh. I spend a lot of time uh, at those and it's currently like fair season here in Texas. There's one in LA right now too. So lots, lots of dressing up actors like costumes. <laughs> <laughs> so do you make your costumes or do you find them? Uh, no, <laughs> I do not make them. <laughs> no, no. I learned how to sew just a little bit in college uh, in the in theater, you have to take like costuming. So I do know my way around mm-hmm. a sewing machine, but it's been so many years that I would kind of have to relearn uh, how to do everything from scratch, like cutting patterns and all of that. Um, so no, I, I let someone else make my costumes. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, you, you put them together from things that you find, you know, with something mm-hmm. like, like Merida, I, I have one Merida costume that is like from the movie and a voice actress friend who is a seamstress. She made that for me a few Halloweens ago. So there are pictures of me and that on the internet. And then the other version that I do, I, I just found everything. Um, mm-hmm. She <laughs> Merida wears this t-shirt and has a bear on it and it says mum. <laughs> and when that movie came out, I was like, I need that shirt. Someone on the internet has made the shirt. And they had, I just like Googled it, like Merida Ralph breaks the internet shirt. And there it was. And I bought it like in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> and uh, she has like a flannel that is the, the, the plaid of like her clan. And I found that at a Disney store in fact so i knew that it's like it's licensed disney merida <laughs> thing and then she wears like shorts and, I, and then i had a big wig that a cosplay friend of mine pointed me to i did i do know some co- pretty cool cosplayers so when i need something and i know that i'm just going to buy it i will ask them to like point me in the right direction for like what is going to be 
a good good um quality for my money and all of that stuff so that's how mm-hmm. I, I i threw that together so <laughs> Awesome. Nice, nice. Use your resources, but did the leg work? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. And then, so you started out as acting on the stage, and then you got into voice acting. Is that mm-hmm. how it went for you? Really yes. similar to Lexi. Mm-hmm. Is that, it seems like that's a really common story with voice actors in the industry now i would really hope so is it i don't know if it's still a common story i know it is lexi's story and that's great and i hope that it continues to be the story um (laughs) because ultimately like we're we're actors first and foremost and then you take away a lot of the other tools that we have when we're getting to act in person and mm-hmm. all you have is your voice. So it's like reducing things down into only the voice. And I feel like if you haven't learned how to do it with everything, you have less to work with uh, going into a booth when you take away all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah. So in, in my experience as a director, I feel like I'm running into more and more aspiring voice actors who are just aspiring voice actors and i just want to encourage them to go be aspiring actors um because it'll probably lead to more voice work because you'll be better you'll be a better actor Mm. i i don't i don't want it's really hard to cast someone with a a cool voice who doesn't know how to act like i don't have i don't have the time to teach you how to act i can take any anybody i can take any (laughs) actor anybody who's been an actor on the stage and teach them how to voice act but it's harder to teach someone with a cool voice how to be an actor <laughs> so, understandable yeah well, that makes sense because like um so we're both looking to get into voice acting and you know we have background in theater like i did a lot of theater in high school and college cool and um the two people that are giving me direction and training right now is uh gerald rivers and john eric bentley and one of the first questions they both asked me is like, do you have theater background? Have you acted before? And I was like, yeah, in high school and college and, you know, occasionally stuff uh, at the theater out here. And they're like, great. So you understand getting into the character presence and all that. It's like, yeah. They're like, all right. Okay. So just do these mm-hmm. workshops. <laughs> <It's> yeah. Like... <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. It's much more fun for me as a director to direct actor actors <laughs> for, lack of a, for lack of a better term because the types of notes and the, the way I get to direct them is just it's deeper we can talk more about intention I can talk about um I could it's just the notes that I give them are more intensive and actually they're a lot more specific if you don't speak the acting language i'm gonna have to like dance around and obfuscate and come up with all of these ways to get to the thing that it is i need you to do because you won't understand the terms otherwise um yeah or maybe i'm i'm just it's more superficial direction how do i get the sound that i need how do i make it sound like you're feeling the thing that i need you Mm -hmm. to be feeling um but uh so yeah please guys just go take acting classes for the love of god (laughs) thank you this is professional advice (laughs) if you want to if you want to survive in this industry and make it big take classes please (laughs) and i can't even i can't even promise about the making it big part like that's (laughs) plenty of really good well-trained actors uh never make it and that's just the way of it so that is true though (laughs) there Sometimes it's like gambling. It's either you get it or you don't. And it's like, if you want to try get there, it's endurance afterwards. Mm-hmm. Well, I would say instead of gambling, I'd say like luck of a draw or so. It can be. But I, I, I think this is true. It was true for me. It's true for Lexi. Probably true for other actors um, that you know and admire. It is about like who you know it can be about getting that one role that really just, you know, breaks you out onto the the scene, as it were. But everybody who's been given that opportunity only uh, succeeded 
in that opportunity because of the work they put in before. There's no such thing as an overnight success. You know, it's, that's, it may seem that way, like overnight they become something in the eyes of the public, but they've been training and they've been working. For me, I was cast at Funimation while I was there on a tour. I was literally there getting a tour of the building uh, from my friend who's an engineer and uh, Eric Vale was directing. And he asked me uh, when he found out I was an actor, had me get into the booth. And I thought that it was just part of the tour. Like, here's what it is inside of the booth. And he said, here's what we do. And there are these beeps and you say this line. So why don't you say this line? And I did it. And when he came out, he's like, give your information to our talent coordinator and you can work here. And four days later, I was recording on a show. Um, wow. that, that wouldn't have happened if I were just Nathaniel's friend who liked anime. You know, I was Nathaniel's friend who liked anime and had a degree in theater. I'm not saying that you have to have a degree. And at that point, I didn't have it. I hadn't graduated yet. I had a semester left. But that I was on my way to become a professional actor. That's what I wanted to do with my life. And this opportunity presented itself. And I stepped into it and was able to uh, perform well because of the work that I'd put in beforehand. And that's true with Lexi. Um, you know, she, I don't even know how I, how did I come across her? I just like met her in a hall or heard about her. I think maybe I just heard her name a few times. And then I heard that she knew Rico. I'm like, Rico, who's this person? And he told me about her. I'm like, wow, she sounds rad and sounds a lot like you. Um, <laughs> cool. And then I, then I met her. Uh, I think doing some Walla and after a Walla session, Mm -hmm. hearing, hearing her voice and working with her just that little bit and understanding how she could respond to notes that I was giving her, like she can do this part. So then I gave her a part in, um, talked Opus Destiny. And that's the first thing that, that we worked on. And from working on that, I knew that, that she could be Tomo, that she had the right type of natural voice for that role. Um, but like she came in with so much training. She has so much control over her instrument um, because mm -hmm. of how she has trained it uh, as a singer and as an actor. And that's awesome. And she's also a huge anime fan. But if she had just been like Rico's friend, the anime fan, I don't care. <laughs> Get in line. Me like it is. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's nice to hear a little bit more details on that story. Like, it wasn't just more than your deck of cards. It was more like uh, the deck of cards and the stats and the history of this mm -hmm. card, per se. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So there's a lot of, I want to say, research and thought behind every step of the production. It's not just cool voice. It's like cool voice and can you do other stuff? I guess. Yeah. Well, as you, as we talked about, like in the beginning of, of the interview, it's crunch time for us. I have five days to get two episodes done. Uh, and we don't have the time to teach somebody how to do the job. Like you really need to come in here. And part of your tools as an actor is being malleable, being able to step into any situation and take the given circumstances and go with that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, trained actors are excellent at that and there are typically very good strong readers who can just cold read and see something for the first time and just do it and then you give them one note and they correct it and fix it and off you go like that's the type of speed that we need to work at like the speed of, of creativity essentially um so it's it's extremely competitive like while it's a great time to be an actor because there is so much work uh it's so competitive because everybody fancies themselves um, a voice actor nowadays, but you will have a leg up if you come in and you have just acting training. You can tell me every person that you've done every online workshop with, and that's great. They're going to give you some tools and some tips and tricks and tell you how to work with a microphone and stuff that you wouldn't learn otherwise. And it's true. There are things about dubbing and ADR dubbing that you can't learn until you're on the job, or at least it used to be that way. But now there's so many workshops that teach you, here's how you read an ADR script. Here's what all of these symbols mean. Here's this, 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 and here's some tricks. That didn't mm -hmm. used to happen. But even so, that's just some information that now you're loaded with, but you haven't, you don't really have the opportunity, the opportunity to put it into practice until you're cast, until you're working. And mm. once you're working, now it's time to prove yourself. 
And that first session or two is going to determine if you continue to be called back for other sessions, if you are given bigger opportunities than just some little bit parts uh, here and there. So, um, and if you have, if you have the, if you've put in the time, it's going to show in those first couple of sessions and, and you'll be invited back. So. Awesome. <laughs> mm. Caitlin Glass said this, so <laughs> and take notes and ingrain this in your brain. Be sure. <laughs> so we've been talking about work a lot. I want to know a little bit more about Caitlin. And one of the things I want to know is what's your go-to snack? Oh my gosh. That's my important. Is it chips? <laughs> is it wow. candy? Um, my is go-to else? snack is uh applesauce <laughs> i eat a lot of applesauce pouches which is horrible for the environment to eat so many applesauce pouches but you can recycle them uh <laughs> but yes i eat i eat a lot of applesauce pouches <laughs> that's you, first for me applesauce. You, you asked now you know now you know yeah so is that at <laughs> home and at work or just at home uh-huh at home um i'll take them to work um, at work, we also have a lot of snacks. Uh, I try not to eat too many of them because it's mainly like chips and crackers. But we have mm -hmm. a lot of we have a lot of fruit and nuts and um, little beef jerky and things like that. So I try to stick to the the fruits and nuts. But typically, I've I've brought uh, applesauce <laughs> from home. <laughs> nice. Um, your favorite TV show and why? <gasps> oh man like currently airing tv show i don't know hey, hey, top three top three Eek. of all time <laughs> oh that's better because i'm like i don't watch that much television like currently airing <laughs> tv i really don't um top three tv shows of all time like the x files like you mean um, like tv tv or does like TV, streaming TV. platforms count. Like no, I, I, I'm saying all time. We're, we're talking theater, TV shows, streaming, like whatever wow. is your go to. I'm like you. I don't really watch a lot outside of anime. Like I don't really watch a lot of modern TV. So like, yeah, X Files, excellent. That's, yeah, that's, I think I'm going to be real boring in this category. And I'm just <laughs> trying to think about the last time I was into a show that I was like, it's on, we have to watch it, and it was probably way back with like the x-files and then i just got busy with theater and life and anime and uh if there's another show i can't think of what it is though i've already mentioned it a couple times i do uh enjoy k dramas a lot i got into korean dramas over the uh pandemic um <laughs> but i've been kind of busy i haven't had like a one that i am watching it's just like anime they every season there's another slew of, of those as well mm -hmm. um i'm not currently watching one so i don't i don't have one to say like i'm, I'm watching this one right now and it's great uh <laughs> i don't know so <laughs> i'll stick with my my boring <laughs> x-files answer it's not boring it's just old <laughs> I'm, I'm old guys okay. <laughs> it is what it is <laughs> So um, I guess my last question would be like during like having to work and during the pandemic, both on the directorial side and uh, as an actor, like what was that experience like, you know, for you in your your opinion? Mm, man, it was it was good. Good is a small word for to try and encompass everything that the ability to work during that time, what it, what it meant to all of us and our sanity. And um, I mean, obviously our bank accounts, but um, it was also good to be challenged. I, think, uh, uh, I mentioned I've been doing this for a while as a staff director and we'd kind of gotten into a groove with the simul dubs and how they worked. We were already up to the two at a time, uh, two episodes a week routine. And uh, it can, like any job, things can get old and feel stale. And uh, the pandemic was horrible and awful. I mean, and it's wild to think of all the other things that were going on in the world while that was happening. Everything political, everything social, um, as well as just people dropping like flies. Um, yeah. 
And uh, so having the escape of something to focus on and knowing that the thing we were focusing on was also going to bring an escape to so many others, it really made us feel like we weren't just, you know, making some stuff, make here's some content, throw, throw it out there, which is what a lot of things on the internet can feel like nowadays because we're just so inundated with all of it. So it, mm -hmm. it, it kind of brought purpose back to our jobs <laughs> and really made me proud to be doing what I'm doing, proud to work for the company that I work for that you know did whatever they could as soon as they could to get equipment out to actors who didn't have it so that we could get actors working again and not just for the sake of us putting out stuff so that we have a company that's putting out stuff but because we you know we care about um the team so you know they uh, invested a lot of money and equipment that they just gave to the actors so that we could work from home. And we were all figuring it out as we went, you know, and that's really cool. Uh, a lot of troubleshooting daily, like, how can we make this work? Okay. This sounds weird. Okay. This internet problem. Okay. you like so much crazy stuff. And then also it was a wonderful time to be extending grace to one another for our <laughs> mistakes and yeah. uh, for, for things that we just couldn't help. Because at the end of the day, it was just a wonderful reminder that while we love our jobs and anime so important to us and so important to so many, it, we're making cartoons and it's okay if you screw up, right? It's okay that uh, your internet is down and we don't get to finish this episode. It's okay. Like it was just, huh, it was a nice time to kind of breathe through all of that. And we Ooh. were we were only doing like one episode at a time. Once we got up to speed, maybe by the end of that pandemic time when we were moving back into the studio where we just getting back to doing two shows at a time um so it was a it was kind of like a reset button uh on on how we do stuff um from an actor's perspective it was wonderful to have the opportunity to work um for other studios because everything became remote and mm -hmm. um for the longest time i feel like there were, there were a handful of us Texas actors that got to dabble in shows and games that were recorded out in Los Angeles. But by and large, you had to live there uh, to work there. And that was kind of the case with us at, at Crunchyroll as well. We were utilizing the internet this, before the pandemic. Uh, for some actors, sometimes, a lot of them were kind of part of the Funimation family because it was when we were still uh, Funimation. Um, and, and had been for years. So whether that was like Johnny Young Bosch or Patrick Seitz, Matt Mercer, uh, LA folks, but they were like our folks too, Todd Habercorn, et cetera. Um, and we would connect with them. And it, 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 so it, it felt like we were always, not always, we were often trying to find ways to bring in actors um, from other places. Maybe it wasn't like a whole show made of people who don't live in Dallas, but um, we were open uh, to it. But we never felt that same openness uh, when studios out there would get an anime, like if they got an anime, it's just going to be LA people, you know? Um, mm. but, but the pandemic opened that up and I got, I got to do a number of things. <laughs> now it was with studios. I had all already worked with, with the exception of one. Um, but before I would just fly out there and do the mm -hmm. thing and then come home. But that wasn't really something you could do with simul dubs. That's very difficult because you can't trust that the flight is going to not get canceled. Um, you know, you, you can't just cast an actor and expect them to fly out weekly. Um, so the opportunity to get to work with some LA studios again, and then work with some new ones has been really cool. Um, I have an agent out in Los Angeles now, and that's, so it's opened a lot of doors and it's, if something good had to come out of all of that mess, I guess uh, that's what has come out of it. It's, unfortunate to i think right now to hear so much negative clap back from actors who are frustrated that now studios want things to be in person again uh sorry if you hear my dog barking there's nothing no, about that no, uh, <laughs> uh it's like they so quickly forget what crunchyroll did just two years ago to keep everybody working um but ultimately, you know, we need to lift the standard of the home video, well, not home video, like the streaming quality and back to what it was um, 
and how it sounds. And it's just mm-hmm. easier to make things sound great if everybody records from the same place or from as few locations as possible, not, mm-hmm. you know, not 20 different closets across America. <laughs> so closets. She said uh, closets. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in my closet. I'm in my closet right now. With, That's like, why I make it so funny. And there's like, this is a great, I've got these really cool. A pads. lot of people anyway. use closets. <laughs> Good yeah. room. Uh, Mark, uh, when he showed us his, he's like, this is where I record. And I was like, Dude, that's so tiny. He's like, yeah, I got to work with what I have. Though. It's the best that they had available yeah. in their home, yeah. <laughs> and they made it work. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful, and I'm more than hopeful. I'm, I'm encouraged. I look forward to a time where we can work more closely again with and have more remote talent. And this is just Caitlin speaking, not Caitlin who also happens to work for Crunchyroll. Like. This, mm-hmm. is, this is not insider information, you guys. This is my individual hope and belief uh, that we will get there because we've always been uh, groundbreaking. You know, we, we want things to be as good as they possibly can be. We want to be able to be united. I hate this, this uh, invisible war that it somehow is like LA is better than Dallas or Dallas is better than, or the idea that we like, don't like each other. It's like, no, we're all friends with each other. We all want to be in all of the things. Okay. Um, so I think we'll get there. It just may be, it'll take some time. Um, there's a lot. They all, folks also forget that we just had a major merger, you know, Fun- Funimation and Crunchyroll, two companies combining. There's a lot more to that than just making your English dubs the way you want them. Uh, now we oversee, like 14 different language dubs across the entire planet, as well as all the other ins and outs of being a a company, you know? So you gotta, you gotta give us some time, but simul dubs have made people impatient and not just simul dubs, just the, the era of streaming entertainment period. Yeah, People want what they want and they want it now. And, uh, so like guys, we need time. <laughs> Please give us time. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, there are thousands of episodes of anime for you to watch in the meantime while we work on this thing that you want. So, yeah. I feel like I've done that before, where I'm waiting for one title. I watch a different anime or a variety of them to fill up my time, so I don't feel like I'm waiting so long. And next thing I know, the next week comes by and it's available. <laughs> Are we yeah. going to see you reprise your role as Elma in Xenoblade potentially in the future? Since I that hope last, so. the, the I... recent games DLC kind of teased. Did so it? Like, <gasps> yes. Did it? Oh my gosh. That's that's news to me. I will have to ask uh, my friends. I, I so hope so. It was such a surprise to get to be a part of uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 after doing Chronicles X, I did not expect that at all. And it was wonderful to connect with the folk. Like that was pre-pandemic and I had to connect like to London, to, to England to record that stuff. And it was, it was hard and weird and crazy. And I'm, I, I'm, <laughs> I worry sometimes that I, that I didn't handle it well. And they're like, we never want to work with her again. But I, I hope that that isn't the case. Like, please have me back Nintendo. It was so great uh, to get to do that. And I, I loved working on that game and that, it's almost 10 years since I recorded. It was 2014, late 20, mid to late 2014 when, when I recorded the X. So um, I love Elma. She's so great. And like people still love her. And every convention I'm at, there are at least a handful of fans that, that will come up and that's what they want to talk about is Xenoblade. So gosh, I hope so. But I don't have any insider information. <laughs> like I really, really don't. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the recent DLC that just came out like a week and a half ago, like it, Combine all the Zeno games, so Blaze, Zeno Blaze, Zeno Saga, Zeno Gears, all of it. Like that wow. last cutscene is like, yeah, it's all connected. I was like, wow. So from 98's original Zeno Gears to now. Okay, cool. I like it. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed that, that they won't just like have her in there not talking. <laughs> that I could be there and, and say words. That would be really cool. I guess we'll see. <laughs> But, but yeah, uh, we want to thank you again for coming on the show, uh, for taking the time with us to talk, and we'd love to have you back on again. And yeah, is there anything? No, pretty much talked about everything I wanted yeah. to do, but we would love to have you on the show again to talk about more. 
And hopefully yeah. you had a good time. <laughs> I did. I did. Thank you guys so much. I'm glad that I randomly woke up as just as I was supposed to be here. Oh my gosh. Crazy. Crazy. So, so yeah, uh, with that being said, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up the show here. So anyone, if, uh, if you listen to this, on any of the major podcasting outlets, you know, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, then, you know, let us know what you think. If you're watching this in video format on Spotify or on YouTube, then definitely comment, subscribe, share, and let us know what you think. But with all that being said, all of Caitlin's social media, like for work purposes, not any personal, all that will be listed down below. So you can give her a follow and tell her and us what you think of the show. And, you know, the Hill's social media will be there as well as mine. And yeah. Yeah, mine's pretty simple. It's at, at Lehua Sipufina on all social media platforms across the board. So if you guys mm -hmm. got questions for our podcast across worlds, let us know there. And you can also find Mikhail Casanova. Across the board, just the same thing. She came up with the name, so yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and Caitlin Glass, you can find her. Uh, and yeah. uh, I'm at Caitlin's Voice on mainly Twitter and Instagram. So, <laughs> All right. So thank you guys for listening to podcasts across worlds. Keep reading manga, keep listening to, or actually watching and listening anime and keep listening to podcasts across worlds. We'll see you guys on the next one. <laughs> thank you for listening to podcasts across worlds. This is a passion project that was created by Lehua Superfina and is co-hosted by myself, Mikhail Casanova. If you enjoyed this episode and any of the topics that we talk about or any of the guests and voice actors and various people we have on the show, then make sure you do us a solid by if you're watching it on YouTube, which is on youtube.com slash Superfina, then make sure you like the video, share it around with someone you think would enjoy it, as well as leave a comment on what you think could be improved or what you liked, what you didn't like, and all that in between. If you're listening to the show on any of the major podcasting outlets, such as Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any of the others, then make sure you leave a rating, leave a comment, interact with the polls that we put out, and so much more. If you want to support the show, we do have Patreon, as well as many other methods for supporting. And with that being said, we're signing out. We hope you enjoyed this, and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Keep listening, keep watching, and keep enjoying podcasts across worlds. We'll see you around.